have to follow up. Margaret has oh. such nice pictures. I'm afraid I don't have any. <laughs> so bear with me. Um, I work on text, um, and I have a lot of text for you. Um, and normally, when I introduce myself, people ask, what is computational linguistics? So this is what we're going to start with. And basically, the, the overarching question here is, how do syntax trees and YouTube videos go together? Because we, we tend to work with both. Except we don't really work with the videos themselves. We work with the, the comments that users have about the videos. Um, so what is computational linguistics? It's also sometimes called natural language processing, NLP. Um, the difference is really, um, if you come from linguistics, you call it computational linguistics. If you come from computer science, you tend to call it natural language processing. <laughs> um, it's the whole thing is, is right, it's the same thing basically. Um, we work with text and we try to make the computer understand text better. Um, we're not there yet, <laughs> but we're working on it. Um, so, and, and this focuses a lot on English, so there's, there's a lot of work on English, but um, these days we try to work on other languages like German, Japanese, Turkish, Arabic, you name it, we'll try to do it. <laughs> Um, the most well-known application is machine translation. Um, if you've ever used Google Translate or Bubblefish or anything else, um, there's a lot of our research in the background of that. And if it doesn't work for you, we can tell you why. <laughs> um, so try that if you haven't yet. Um, sometimes it's pretty good, sometimes it's spectacularly bad. <laughs> um, but there's more applications, and we're basically doing a little bit more basic research. Um, so, what does computational linguistics mean for me? This is a huge field, and if you ask five people what it is, you probably get some different answers. Um, so for me, at the moment, I'm working on ranking YouTube videos based on their comments. So I want to know, if you look at different videos, which one's funnier, or which one is cuter, or which one is more absurd or whatever. Um, we're also trying to rank cooking recipes um, based on the comments. So what makes a good recipe? Does it have to have a lot of butter? Does it have to have a lot of sugar? Well, sugar should not be that good um, if you have a stew. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it, it depends on the categories. And we try to find out if you can tell from what the users are saying about the recipes whether this is a good one or a bad one. Um, this is getting more technical, so we also do sentence simplification, and I have examples for that, so I'll skip that for now. Um, we just started working on a writing assistant for language learners. Um, so if you learn Spanish or any other language, sometimes it can be really annoying. You have your dictionary, but um, your dictionary gives you individual words. It doesn't give you phrases a lot of the times, and, and if you have this one phrase and you know it's not the combination of the individual words, but you want something different, your dictionary cannot help you. So we're trying to help the user, in, in that case, to find a good translation for that phrase. Um, and the last one is the most technical one. Um, I won't show you very much. But um, I, I do a lot of syntactic analysis. So I want to know who does what to whom. And there has been a lot of work done on English. Um, in English, we have this great resource, which is based on the Wall Street Journal. So it's about the most boring text you can imagine, but they have been annotated. Um, we don't have a lot of resources for other languages. They're starting to, to um, show up, but um, it's a lot of work to annotate those. Um, so it's not very likely that we get a lot of these resources. And um, if you go to languages that have more morphology, that have more different forms in the words than English does, um, parsing is a lot harder. And I'll show you that. Okay, going back to my YouTube videos, I just copied a couple of comments to one of the videos. I won't show you the video. So I'll ask you, do you think that's a funny video? Yes or no? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was a pretty funny one, obviously. <laughs> um, so we're trying to look through these um, comments, try to analyze them. And a lot of the um, methodology that we have at the moment is just looking at um, are there certain words that occur in there? Um, so if you, you would assume if, if there's a lot of funny or ha 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 or so in there, then it's a funny one. But if you say it's not funny, or I don't think this is funny, then um, it's a lot harder for us to find that, and um, we have to go deeper into that. So this is one of the areas we're working on. 
And then the ranking is really hard because it turns out that um, YouTube video, um, people who comment on YouTube videos are very positive. So the rating is from one through five, I think. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of five ratings, you don't get very many one ratings. So getting the five ratings right is really easy, getting the one ratings right is really difficult. <laughs> Um, sentence simplification. I'm, I'm skipping the, the cooking recipes um, because that's basically the same thing. Um, I have a sample sentence and this is actually from this resource, so this is from the Wall Street Journal. Do you understand what they're talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see that this might be really difficult to understand by somebody, mm -hmm. either by the elderly or somebody who has certain impairments? Um, so what we're trying to do is to split it up into different bits and pieces to make it more easily understandable. A lot of people do that for um, people with um, impairments. Um, don't ask me. Um, so different people have different kinds of constructions that they don't understand. Um, so if you have something like um, the book was given to him, that's a lot harder to understand than somebody gave him the book. Um, we try to do that for a different reason. We try to find out what the meaning is behind these sentences. And processing meaning is really, really hard. We have no idea really how to do that. And we can't do it for the big sentence. We can do it much more easily for these smaller sentences. So at the moment, this is a pre-processing step for finding out what the meaning is and if we can fuse different pieces of meaning together in a meaningful way. Writing assistant. I mentioned that a little bit before. So um, this is a situation where you trans try to translate something into Spanish, um, but you, you happen to have a blank here, so you don't know what live with means in Spanish. Um, and if you look that up in a dictionary, you will find live and you will find with, but you're not sure if um, the translations that you get are the correct ones or which ones to take out of the 20 different ones that you get. Um, so this is what you find in the lexicon for live with. Um, I actually looked that up. <laughs> so how do you know which one is the correct one? And we're trying to have um, an automatic tool that finds out which is the best translation in this context in the language. So we assume that um, the person has been able to translate the rest of the sentence, it's just this one phrase that's missing. Um, there was a shared task where people could participate. So um, there's one group that provided the data sets and um, we had a certain amount of time to submit our results. Um, I think we made second place, and we didn't even manage to put in the, the intelligent technology that we had. <laughs> so at the moment, our students are sitting in the lab and trying to evaluate the more intelligent approach that we have, and we're still hoping that this will make the paper um, by the end of the month. Yeah. Um, so what we're doing is <coughs> we're trying to find the it involves a lot of machine translation, surprisingly. <laughs> um, but we take the, the machine translation system internally has a lot of suggestions. And we take those suggestions and try to find the best one um, based on more information that we have from, from the context. Last one. This is the scary part, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as I said, I'm interested in syntactic analysis, in automatic syntactic analysis, which we call parsing. Um, so we're trying to find this automatic analysis for the sentences, and we try to do that not for English. Everybody can do English. Um, we try to do it for languages like German or Arabic or Turkish, which are hugely complicated because for one word, in English you have maximally five different forms. So verbs can be in the base form, they can be in the ing form, in the s form, in the ed form, um, and then you may have an irregular form, but that's about it. If you go to Turkish, you have thousands of different forms for one word. Um, and this makes it a lot harder because that normally means we would need a lot more data. And in English, we have a data set that has 50,000 sentences annotated. It was a huge effort. Um, in most languages, we have a lot less data. Um, but we have a lot more word forms. So that means a lot of the words we don't even see. And on top of that, if you have all these different word forms, um, normally what you have is free or word order. So in English there's only one way to say a sentence. Um, the doctor gave the patient a pill. 
if I do that in German, I have six different varieties. I can have the doctor gives the patient a pill, the patient gives the doctor the pill, and so on and so forth, and they all mean the same thing because it can tell from the markings on the words which case they have, so whether which one is the person doing the giving, the person who's getting the pill, and, and what is given. Um, and we can do that with kind of tree structures, or these days it's becoming more important that we do dependencies, which are connections between two words, and that actually turns out to be a lot easier than what we're doing here. <laughs> and I hope it looks a little less scary. <laughs> That's it. Um, thanks for your patience. So beyond that, you initially gave us some applications for this. Mm -hmm. So aside from those, what are some places where you're imagining where this could be, this will be used? Um, we actually have a project with refusing soft and hard information. <laughs> um, for those of you who are not familiar with that jargon, um, hard information is, is the hard readings that you get from instruments, so that's mo mostly numbers. Or it could also be videos because you could translate that into pixels. But then the soft information is whatever humans produce. And um, we, we don't really know how to put these two types of information together. So we are analyzing um, the, the soft information side. And then um, I'm working with people in Miami who are doing the fusion part. So they have algorithms. They, they have a special kind of probability theory that allows them to model uncertainty. Um, and, and we're trying to put that together. So cases like the unaware bomber, where it was previously known that this person is dangerous and he's traveling to the US. Um, that could have been avoided if they could have put these different pieces of information together. And, and we're trying to work on that. Um, summarization is another one. Um, you have a lot of times you have a lot of, I don't know, meeting um, reports. Um, but if you have thousands of meetings, how do you figure out which ones go together? or? Um, I don't know, if, if you have customer calls at a company, how do you figure out which ones, um, so if you want a big picture, um, we can do that too with these kinds of technologies. Or you can summarize the book in five pages. Uh, it would be great for the students to have it. <laughs> at this point, don't worry, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's actually what I'm concerned about um, from a moral standpoint as a language instructor um, who has caught students in the act of using online translators because of the spectacular failures of those <laughs> softwares, of uh, those um, tools. Uh, is there some discussion about the, the use or the application? The writing assistant, I can see. Um, at the moment, this is not a problem because normally you see right away if something is translated automatically, it's just not good enough. Um, so it uh, is actually used in um, in businesses, but normally you have to have a post editor um, to fix the, the biggest mistakes. Um, yes, people are talking about that, that at some point if the methodology really gets to a certain point, um, you may not be able to tell that anymore. But so far, I think we're like years away from that. Um, so we don't really see it as a big problem at the moment. <laughs> So the example you gave in German, you said there was at least six um, var variants. Yeah. So was that an audio transmission or was it written? How did you get the contextual information? Well, I'm assuming it's for some kind of metadata. Um, um, German has a case system. So we're marking what is my subject, what is my direct object, what is my indirect object. So you can do that actually in writing. It, um, in English, you can do a little bit like that if you say something and stress something. Um, in German, in a lot of the cases, you don't have to do that because we're marking what is my subject. So I can say, the Arzt gibt dem Patienten die Pille, um, where dem Patienten, th that marks the indirect object. So who's getting um, whatever is giving. Um, if it were the giver, it would be their patient. So you have different forms. to translate languages, how do you, from your profession, how can it become better? Long story. <laughs> um, what companies like Google do at the moment is mostly they look at 
and they use machine learning. So they, they have a huge training set where they have the sentence in English and then the sentence, let's say, in German. Um, so they can figure out, if you see a lot of these sentences, um, and every time you see book in English, you see book in German. They can figure out from, from seeing a lot of these examples that book always translates into book in German. Um, but that, that's, that's also the problem. Um, they work with a lot of text, but they don't do a lot of analysis. So they, they learn this probability model saying this translates into that which works fine if you go from German to English, because in German you have a lot of forms, and they all translate into the same form in English. If you go to German, you have to get the case system right. So you have to know whether it's der Patient, dem Patienten, dem Patienten, or whatever. And um, if you don't know what the syntactic function is, you cannot do that. So at the moment, they're working on getting more analysis into the system. And for a long time, Google was actually resistant to that. So um, th there's a famous saying, um, every time I fire a linguist, my system gets better. Yeah. That's not true anymore. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, language also evolves, change, yes. and also there's different things like the distance of places. Mm -hmm. Even the same language, the language yeah. is different. Yeah. So it's really hard, like, it's always necessary to update, 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 catch up with those changes. And at this moment, we're not even worried about that <laughs> so much. We're worried about getting um, the most important parts right. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you're right. And you may have noticed for people who use Google Translate now and then, they now actually have a capability for you to correct the sentence. So if you mm -hmm. actually test the sentence, try to translate it and say, no, this is wrong, I know that, then you can fix it. And that means if you fix it for them, they put it in their training data, and next time they're better. Yeah. Um, and that also works um, for if you have new words, for example, that occur in the language. If somebody tests that and then is willing to correct it, they actually have it in the training. <coughs> the next um, catching differences in, let's say, between Eng British English and American English, um, you can do that too. If you have more specific models, so have one model for American English, one model for British English, mm -hmm. and then you probably have to guess, um, but Google normally knows where a person is located because they know the IP address of the computer that you're using. Mm -hmm. So um, if an American happens to be in, in Britain, they will probably get the British version and not the American version, except if they, they um, select for the English. Good question. Um, other than Google and maybe Microsoft Research, who hires computational linguists? Google and Microsoft are big ones at the moment. Nuance is another one. Um, but there's tons of startups, um, also here in the Midwest, surprisingly, that do a lot of military work. <laughs> so our students oftentimes get half jobs before they even finish their PhD. <laughs> oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to just add, there's another area that opened for a computational linguists, actually. It's medical field. Because they have all the now database um, system in the hospitals, and, and they hire as well, so yeah. it's another area. So we actually we collaborated with a small company in Terhout. Um, they do medical transcriptions, and they approached us and said, "Can you put the periods and the commas in?" <laughs> and we said, "Yes, we can." <laughs> uh, that was before we knew that they're not using the medical speech recognition system, but a normal one. So every time they had a medical term, it was translated into something that's normal language. <laughs> 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 and if, if you have a total mess, then it's kind of hard to put the periods and the commas in. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra.